I'm glad you were here today. We're wrapping up our sermon series. We've been walking our way through, um, probably jogging our way through is probably more appropriate, jogging our way through the book of Philippians. Uh, We've been taking a chapter a week, and this week we are in Philippians chapter 4. So if you do have a smartphone, feel free to open up that or grab a Bible. They're in the pews in front of you. If you want to follow along, I will stay exclusively in Philippians 4 this week. And we've been looking at our perspectives on things as we've gone through this book. And the the, the title of the sermon today is Rethinking Worry. Now, just a quick survey. How many of you worry? Yeah? Hands up, you know. If you worry, put your hands up, right? We we all probably worry about something at some point, right? And how many of you didn't raise your hand because you were worried about who was going to see you raise your hand? (laughs) Right? We have those kind of people too. It's like, well, what will they think if I raise my hand? Craig Rochelle, in his book, uh, Soul Detox, talks about a principle that I really like, that really resonated with me on this subject. And he says this. He says, whatever you fear the most reveals what you value the most. Whatever you fear the very most in all of the world reveals those things that you value the most. So in other words, if you're worried about your kid's safety, that's because you place a very high value on your kids, right? If you're worried about finding a spouse someday, that's because you put a a high value on marriage and on relationships, right? What you fear the most reveals what you value the most. The second thing he, he really put into my head as I looked through this book He says this, and and I think this is very insightful. Craig Rochelle says, What you fear the most reveals where you trust God the least. Huh, think about that. What you fear the most, it reveals our heart. It shows where we trust God the least. Now, you might want to push back on that. But I'd caution you from it. Hear me out, because we're going to be talking about that today. What you fear the most reveals where we trust God the very least. And, And I think the really important part about this, about what you fear the most, about what you worry about the most, is that it is indeed a window into a spiritual health issue in our hearts. And that is, what you worry about the most is indeed where you trust God the least. In fact, I saw a definition that said it this way, a definition of worry. It said, worry is the sin of distrusting the promises and power of God. That's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? When we're worrying about something, how often do you frame your worries that you're distrusting God. I don't. I suspect many of you don't either. But the truth of the matter is, when we are worrying, we are often forgetting about the power and the promises that God has made to us as Christ's followers. And we all are at this point at some time. We have to be honest, right? Most all of your hands went up a moment ago. Some people worry about things like the economy. Some people worry about the upcoming election. Some people worry about their finances. They worry about the stability of their jobs. They're consumed about what kind of grades are they going to get. They worry about their health. They worry about their relationships. They worry about their kids. They worry about this, that, and the other thing. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on with what we worry about. Worry is baggage. And the more baggage you drag, the more tired you get. The more tired you get, the more susceptible you are to other sorts of failings. The more susceptible you are to Satan's little whispers. The more susceptible you are to struggle, to failure. What I want to do today is show from the book of Philippians... This key thought, if you're taking notes, it's this. Worry is a matter of perspective. Worry is a matter of perspective. 
And what we worry about really is a matter of perspective. And if there's anyone in the world who's ever had reason to worry, the, the Apostle Paul had some pretty good reasons to worry, right? <coughs> Excuse me. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing the book to the church of Philippi, if you've missed the last few weeks, let me remind you, right? Here's the setting. Here's the context where Paul is at. Paul is sitting in a Roman prison and 24 hours a day, he is chained to one of his captors. He is chained to a soldier. Four times a day, he gets a new soldier. All day long, all night long, Paul is chained up. Paul had always dreamed of going to Rome. He wanted to go there and preach the gospel. Instead, Paul goes there as a prisoner. And he's sitting there waiting for a judgment. And that judgment could come any day. And that judgment could be the end of his life. They could basically say, Paul, off with your head. And that would be it. And that would be the end. And it would be all over and done. And so Paul is living in this setting. And he's writing these letters to churches. And he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. If anyone had reason to worry, it was the Apostle Paul. But, Paul had a different perspective, didn't he? Paul had a very different perspective on God than most people, particularly in this time. Because remember, Paul is the one who says this, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing, right? Shall trouble? No. How about hardship? Paul says, no. Can persecution separate you from the love of God? Clearly not. How about famine? How about nakedness? How about peril? How about the sword? What can separate us from the love of God, Paul says? Nothing. Nothing at all can separate you from the love of God. And Paul proclaims this because he has a different perspective. Paul had seen the faithfulness of God through more life tragedies than most of us could ever imagine, right? He'd seen God be faithful to him when he was shipwrecked multiple times and he should have died. He'd seen God's faithfulness when he was bitten by poisonous snakes that rightfully should have killed him. He's seen God's faithfulness when he was persecuted. He's seen God's faithfulness when he was whipped, when he was beaten. He saw God's faithfulness when they took him to the edge of town and they stoned him and thought he was dead and left him lying in the ditch on the side of the road. But he saw God's faithfulness again and again and again. Paul saw saw God's faithfulness. And so he writes about what he has experienced. He tells the church at Philippi, and this is almost hard to believe unless you know Paul's story. Paul says, hey, Philippians, don't worry. It's not quite don't worry, be happy, right? You remember that song? But don't worry and be joyful. Happy and joyful are a little bit different. Paul says, don't worry. Did the Philippians know where Paul was at? Yes, they did. That's why they sent him the gift that we've talked about in the past. They knew the hardship he was experiencing. They took up a special love offering and sent it off to Paul so that he and his ministry could be sustained during this very, very difficult time. And Paul writes back to them, Hey guys, don't worry. And so from a Roman prison shackled to a guard, he writes this in verses 4 and 5 of Philippians 4. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say it. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone because the Lord, the Lord is at hand. When you see the Lord as Paul has seen him, He's going to show that 
You have nothing to worry about. How many of us just accept worry as part of our day-to-day lives? How many for you that worry has just become second nature? Worry is almost a security blanket for some people. There's people who worry when they don't have something to worry about. You ever met those folks? Right? You may think I'm joking. You meet one of them. You'll know what I'm talking about. We worry about a lot of stuff. Paul says, don't worry. And then we often like, we try to soften the word, right? I'm not worried about this. I'm just concerned. Right? Well, you don't have to be worried if you know the Lord as Paul knew the Lord. And he's going to teach us two things within this. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. We don't have to worry about what will happen when we know who's in charge, right? In other words, we don't have to worry about the how. How is this going to happen when we have the who, when we have God? We don't have to worry about the how when we have the who. Sounds kind of like Dr. Seuss. But when we have God, we might not know how it's going to go, but we know who is going to go with us, right? We do not walk alone. My mother cross-stitched for me a number of years ago. My my mother-in-law cross-stitched for me a number of years ago. The footprints. Little poem, right? Where there was two feet, two tracks. Pretty soon there was one. The man says, well, where were you then, Lord? And the poem goes on and says, that was when I was carrying you. Or in my case, it's just two long lines where he's dragging me, right? (laughs) But she didn't put that in mind. But that's how it often goes, isn't it? Is God greater than your problems? Think about the things that you worry about. Is God greater? If God isn't greater than your problems, we need to work on your understanding of who God is. God is greater. Is God in control of that situation? If he isn't, we're all in trouble. God is in control. And while it's hard, because we want to be in control, right? I want to control my destiny. I want to be master of my own domain. I want to make the decisions about how things are going to go, because I know the way I like things. Right? And if we just do it my way, everything will be great. Well, I've learned that's not true. I'm broken. I make bad decisions. I have wrong opinions. I have bad ideas. And so, in those moments where we begin to worry, we have to stop. We have to pause. We have to reflect and think to ourselves, is God greater than this problem? And is God in control? And if he is, then we need to rest in him. We need to abide in him. We need to find peace in him. Find the peace that he has promised us. Peace. Peace is the opposite of worry. It might be worth writing down, so you can reflect on that. Peace is the opposite of worry. When you are resting in God, when He gives you His peace, you no longer have to worry. How many of you think we need more peace in our world? Yeah? 
I think it's pretty universal. And God promises us peace. A peace that transcends all understanding. Right? This is the word of Scripture. Not my words. God is good and He gives us these words. And these words are true. These promises are real. And God says, buddy, I got this. And maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe this message was, maybe I was sitting at home thinking it's just for you, right? I thought of you by name last night and said, I'm going to write this just for you. I didn't. But maybe you've been holding on too tight to something. Maybe it's been many somethings. Worrying too much. Wearing yourself out worrying. But not making any difference by worrying. If you've ever made a fist, you squeeze it tight. You can do it right now if you want. How long can you hold that tight fist? I'm squeezing tight right now. I've lifted a lot of weights in my life. I'm a pretty strong guy. I'm still squeezing tight. I'm starting to feel it already right here. In just this little bit of time. And I'm squeezing. Oh, and I can feel it starting to spread towards my elbow now. Okay. I don't know how long I can hold this fist. I don't know how long I can hold on tight. But I can hold on for a little while. Oh, now I'm starting to feel it on this side too. If I don't stop pretty soon, I'm not going to be able to use my hand later. So I'm going to let go. Oh, and it hurts. I've got fingernail prints in my hand now. But we do that in life. We grab onto something. We think we're strong enough to hold on to something. If I just hold on to this long enough, I will get my way. Right? Wrong. Our endurance fails. We fatigue. Worry does nothing but wear us out. Worrying isn't going to help you, and it certainly isn't going to help God. Yeah, we do it anyhow. Seems a little illogical, doesn't it? The Bible is clear. You have to trust in the Lord. And worry reveals our hearts. Now that doesn't mean we're not actively involved in things, right? We still have to be active in the process. We still have to do our part. We still have to do what only we can do in the situation. And then trust God to do what we cannot. And then in that... We have to release control of the process. Turn the situation over to God. Because you see, God works perfectly in His timing, in His perfect timing, in His perfect ways. Now, we should admit, we don't always like God's schedule. We don't always like God's plan. We don't always like the path that God may be taking us on. But again, which one of us is God? A hard lesson I've learned multiple times in my life when I thought this is how things were going to go. God has thought otherwise. Who do you think has won those arguments? I stand here today as evidence of one of them. There was a time a long time ago where I didn't believe God's calling on my life that I should be a pastor. Not me. I was crazy. I wasn't worthy. I didn't know enough about the Bible and a whole bunch of other stuff. I had a bunch of baggage. I had a bunch of brokenness. I had a bunch of problems. I had a bunch of issues. A bunch of stuff that I was worried that God, you just can't work with me. I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. I'm broken. I'm flawed. I failed. So I worried and I worried. And I didn't think I was good enough. Maybe I'm not good enough, I don't know, but I guess I'll let you be the judge of that. But here I stand today, nonetheless. And over time, God broke me. And then over time, 
God has healed me. And because of my brokenness, within that healing, then God has used me. And he can do the very same to you with whatever it is you are worrying about. Do your part and trust God with the rest. So quick pop quiz. How many of you, by worrying, can fix the health of your family members? No? We don't have any of those folks here? How many of you, by worrying, can fix your broken relationships? How many of you, by worrying, can protect your kids or your grandkids from all the dangers of the world? Can your worry heal addiction? Which one of you, by worrying about it, is going to fix the election or our economy? I'm not hearing a whole lot. It's kind of quiet today. Do what you can and trust God with what you cannot do. Look at verses 8 and 9. I love Paul. He writes some great words. Paul writes these words. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, but he writes to the brothers. Finally, church at Philippi, finally, believers, finally, you and me, finally, us, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, (coughs) excuse me, whatever is commendable, If there is any excellence, if there is anything at all worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What should we be thinking about instead of worrying? Whatever is true, honorable, pure, just, lovely, etc., right? We have to rethink our worry. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen to you when you know who is in control, when you know who is in charge. You give it to the Lord and you let his peace guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your soul through Christ Jesus. Remember, Paul's writing this from prison. The church of Philippi was worried about Paul. They said, Paul, we know you're in jail. Paul, we know your life is on the line. We, Paul, Paul, we know any day now you may be getting a death sentence. We're worried about you, Paul. What do we do, Paul? What's Paul's response? Don't worry, trust God. Don't worry. Be joyful. Verse 10, he says this. He says, I received in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. What he's doing here is he's thanking them for this gift. Remember, we talked about this the last couple of weeks. They took up a love offering. They sent this money to Paul. Paul was unable to be a tent maker while he's literally 24 hours a day in jail. So to support his ministry, they send him some money. And because of his special relationship with this church at Philippi, where he would have rejected this money from most churches, because he has a special relationship with the church at Philippi, because they're probably his favorite church, he receives this love offering. He says, okay, I'm going to take your money. And he's moved by their love for him. And they say they're concerned. They say they're praying for him and that they love him. And so he says this in verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. Whatever situation I'm in. Paul had some good situations. Paul had gone to towns and seen ministry flourish. Paul had seen people come from hundreds upon hundreds of miles away to sit at his feet and study and hear the stories 
about the love of Jesus. Paul knew the good. But Paul also knew the bad. And Paul says, regardless, whatever may come, I'm content. How many of you are naturally content? I'm not a naturally content person. I'll admit that. I'm not naturally content. And I think we are not naturally content in general because contentment, or discontentment in fact, our discontentment comes because of our sinful nature. But, Paul says, because of God's goodness, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And how is that possible, you might ask? Well, if you look at verse 13, he says this. You've heard this verse before. Paul says, I'm content because I can do all things. I can endure all things. Because of the one who strengthens me. Not by Paul's power. Not by Paul's abilities. Paul wasn't saying, I put my hope and trust in the money you sent. Paul doesn't say, I put my trust in the big car, the big house, the 401k. No. I can do all things only because of the one who strengthens me. My life is in the Lord, Paul says. Maybe the circumstances of your life right now have you worried. They have you down. Maybe you're sweating the details today. Let me remind you, God is still good. God is still greater than whatever your problems may be. And we can rejoice in that because we know that God is working in all things to bring about good to those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. What we worry about speaks volumes about whether or not we trust God in being in control of our lives. Maybe right now you need to do some business with God on the subject. Maybe you've been operating on the false idea that you're in control. We're going to have communion here in just a little moment. And as we enter into that time, I would challenge you. Examine your heart. Think about what have I been worrying about? Where do I need to trust God? Is it with my health? With my spouse? At school? My finances? My kids? Where do we need to trust God? Examine the things that you've been worrying about. Do some business with God and find peace. And in peace, find freedom from the peace that transcends all of our understanding. God already knows about it. He just wants us to be honest with Him about it. Turn it over to God and take hold of that peace. The peace that only He can provide. Let's pray.